Steve Weinstein. Rick Azar. Tom Jones. Meet these giants of Buffalo television. The longest running and most popular anchor team in broadcast history. Now in a WBBZ television special, Giants of Buffalo Television. Hello everybody, John DeShulo with you here on WBBZ TV with our executive producer and owner of the station, Phil Arno. Phil, may I just say that we are in the presence of Giants. They are here in our studio and uh, I'm speaking, of course, of the legendary WKBW Eyewitness News anchor team, Herb Weinstein, Rick Azar, and Tom Joles. Such an honor to have them here uh, at, w, at uh, WBBZ. It, it doesn't get any better. It never got any better. And it's a, it's, it's a pleasure to have them here. This is, this is terrific. It's a great honor. You know, I, and I want to start with Rick, because in many ways, Rick, what Phil has done here is, well, he, he has done, not in many ways, he has done by putting a new television station on the air. It's only been on the air a few years. And what was it like when you first signed on WKBW putting that station on the air? What was the aura like in that building then, the spirit of creativity? What word did you use? Aura? Aura. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there was no aura. <laughs> there was no such thing as aura. Yeah. Don't throw those words. Yeah. Right, this, no, it was very, <laughs> this will be a very short program. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> Much like today. Well, I, yeah. can, I can barely remember yeah. 1958. Well, you, know? you, remember, you remember this. The what turned out to be Channel 7 was formerly the Churchill Tabernacle Church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Dr. Clinton Churchill was a radio evangelist mm -hmm. and uh, owned uh, the radio station and then the television station. Yes. Uh, Well-known Bible works. Is that what it's? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's well, right. That's well, exactly KBW right. was well-known <laughs> Bible. Was. Very good. That's well that's known. the winning trivia question <laughs> of all time. Rick, do you remember the logo that Channel 7 used when he went on the air? No, I don't. That's a long time ago. The rabbit. Oh yeah, right. remember? <laughs> I I remember going you going on the air, and I'm at home in Lockport watching on a Sunday afternoon, right? Yeah. Yankee Doodle Dandy was the movie, and I'm afternoon. thinking to myself, oh, if only I could be in that <laughs> spot. Rabbit. If only I could be a rabbit. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, and he is. He has he's all, six children Rick, and eighteen grandchildren. Rick has always been uh, kind of an idol of mine because I was always looking after him, or up to him, uh, as, as his broadcast career started. He started in Lockport, um, among other small, you were yeah, in Niagara no, Falls, Lockport too. Was the first but I knew him in Lockport, and uh, I used to uh, go there, I was probably 17, maybe 16, and I would press my nose against the glass yes, and, I remember and that watch vi Rick vividly. Azar and again say, you know, oh my God, I, I want to be like him someday. Yeah. <laughs> I'm walking around in the studio, and there's this face <laughs> in the door, right? And his nose pressed up against his face <laughs> looking into there. It was him. <laughs> yeah. I say, what kind of a strange yeah. character is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you're right, a strange character. <laughs> but you know, because uh, Channel 7 was previously uh, the Churchill Tabernacle, uh, it was very simple for them to put a stein identifying the station <laughs> outside. All they did was, there was a cross, a big cross. Yeah. They just knocked off one side of the cross. <laughs> yeah. So it was a kind of a, it looked like a seven. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't even have to spend money on that. <laughs> That's what, right. what was Clinton yeah. Churchill like? What was Doc Churchill like? We never saw him. No. He had an office up front in the radio building. Yeah. And, uh, I imagine he probably came out from time to time to <laughs> go to the bathroom, <laughs> but, but we very rarely saw him. His son was the manager yeah, uh, yeah. of the station, and uh, I think he, he brought him in in the morning and gave him his marching orders, <laughs> and, uh, and that's pretty much the way it was. They told us, do anything you would like to do, you're talented people, just don't cost us our license. Yeah. Well, Dr. Yeah. Churchill had a, a turkey farm in Newfane, and my grandparents lived in Newfane, and we would go to visit them, and my grandmother <laughs> and grandfather would say, let's drive by the Churchill estate and see if we can see them. Now, I was, you know, this big at the <laughs> time. I had no idea who, and then I ended up 
Well, I never worked for him because it was Cap Cities then, but I mean, the man had a great storied history, yeah. but he raised turkeys at yes. one time, which probably Where a lot of people... Where was that? Was that in Colden? Where was it? In that? Newfane. Newfane, yes. Yeah. And you <laughs> could tell you, as soon as you started hearing... <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You knew that you were near the Churchill estate. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. No, that, those were... Those were very interesting days because television was young. Very young. Television was young. This was 1958 when the station Correct. signed on. Uh, I believe the first television stations went on in small numbers in maybe 55, 56. Even before that, I Channel 4 went on in 48. But it was very young. So oh, there were four. no... The great thing for people working in television in those days, and I didn't join the television station until 64, because I was working in radio. I was just one of those stupid, <laughs> stupid radio guys, you know? But uh, the thing is that the rules were not hard and fast. You were making it up day by day. Yep. You were flying, literally, flying by the seat of your pants. Because you didn't have anybody to emulate. Because right. there wasn't anybody ahead of you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you had, I mean, there was Ward Fenton. <laughs> Good old John Ward. Corbett. <laughs> yeah. they, these were Channel 4 guys. And they had to stir them every once in a while. Wake That's up. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> to, to see if they would. No. No. So it was exciting. I mean, we were there. You were there primarily in the beginning. Yeah, right at the very beginning. And... Uh, having come from radio over in, in 64, I was on radio from 58 to 64, and I thought the transition to television would be relatively simple. Ha, ha, I ha. mean, br yeah, <laughs> that's right. Ha, ha, ha. It's two totally different animals. Yeah. And it took me a good three to six months to adjust to being on television. In radio, you could come into the studio naked. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, some of our pe better people <laughs> did. <laughs> and uh, just sat down, you know, yeah. in front of a microphone and <laughs> do your thing. And, uh, but television was all, it was all button up and neckties and, oh, yeah. you yeah, know, it, it, was, right. it was very formal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, I think overall I had more fun in radio. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, because but, televi never, but television know, paid better. You never dressed up in in radio. Never. You were one of well, those people that were cover them up. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Please cover them up fast. I was going to say you were probably the beginning anchor team that started the friendly conversation between between the the, th the three of us. Right. Nobody yeah. did that before. It was pretty stiff and it formal. It was very right. stiff and formal, and you broke that mold, That's and right. well, that was the thing that made, one of the things that made you yeah. unique. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the audience, I think, uh, they were probably startled. They recognized <laughs> that we looked like human beings, <laughs> and that we actually were warm-blooded people. <laughs> yeah. And that was, came as a surprise, because, uh, with due respect to the people who were on the air at the other stations, they were uh, stiffer, more formal, <laughs> uh, straight down the line. Oh, absolutely. It had to be this way. When we made mistakes, as we <laughs> sometimes did. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as uh, we sometimes the did. Audience, the audience enjoyed it. It made yeah. us more... Human. Human. Yeah. Right. There's more with Irv, Rick, and Tom, Giants of Buffalo Television, right after this. Welcome back to the Giants of Buffalo Television. Rick, when you were at the station in 1958, did you start by doing the sports? Because I know you did no. other programs, too, no, like no, Buffalo no. Bandstand and American Bandstand. Yeah, in those days, um, except for the news, uh, most everything else was done by a person known as a staff announcer. They don't have that kind of word around anymore. That came, I was a staff announcer at NBC in New York when I got this phone call from a guy named Labe Mel, who was the program manager apparently at Channel 7. And he called me and uh, said, um, we'd like to have you come back to Buffalo and be on the staff at a new 
uh, station that's going on the air. And uh, I, come on, are you kidding? I'm not going to go back to Buffalo. I'm, I'm a staff announcer. At, and it, it's the place that every announcer in the country wanted to be right. there, right? So, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, so, well, we want you to come back and pop, 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 pop. So, I, so I go to the powers that be at, uh, at NBC, and I said, is it possible to get a long-term contract? They only worked on 12-week contracts in those days. And you get your contract renewed every 12 weeks. That's every three months you get a, a new contract or an extension of your present contract. No, we can't do that. So I said, well, you got two weeks' notice. And they said, you're kidding. I said, no, I'm not kidding. I got a job in Buffalo, and they want me to go back and sign a station on the air in Buffalo, and that's what I'm going to do unless you can give me a better contract. Well, we can't do that. We wish we could. Well, two weeks' notice, and two weeks later, I'm here in Buffalo. A week after that, NBC calls we can make your deal. I said, too late, by click, and I never went back to New York. No yeah. regrets, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think one of the things the audience may not appreciate or know is that our lives in broadcasting didn't begin at Channel 7 or WKBW Radio. We all started yeah. in different places. Right. You started at... USJ in Lockport. WUSJ in Lockport. Mm -hmm. And you did what? Uh, I did everything. Uh, sweeping the floor. I did the farm show. I did <laughs> yeah. sports. I did news. I did a disc jockey. You sure. did everything. Yeah. Sure you did. And you? And WHLD in Niagara Falls. Same thing. Right. And, and uh, I was lucky enough that I, they gave me a show just before Joe Rico, who was a big time jazz uh, jockey here and a big time impresario. And I got to meet all of the great people that he would book into right. town. So I was lucky. Right. Just got but lucky. Those were those were tough days. You, yeah, you, you know, right. you work 60, 70 hours a week yep. for whatever the <laughs> boss decided he was going to pay you. Yeah. I worked in a little radio station in Parkersburg, West Virginia, beautiful <laughs> downtown Parkersburg, <laughs> on the fifth floor of a commercial office building. Yeah. Uh, the station was WCEF. Uh, and it was named after the owner of the station, who also happened to be the general manager and the sales <laughs> manager. And he had a sh music show in the afternoon. His name was Clarence E. Franklin, <laughs> thus WCEF. Yeah. Okay. So he was one of these guys. He was a real Yahoo. Uh, <laughs> he, he expected you to do uh, incredible things for very little money. Of course. And I was there about a year, and I was making $65, $65 a week. And I got an offer from a little TV station, which had just opened, down the road in Clarksburg, West Virginia. And it was $10 more a week. Ooh. Well, $10 Big more money. a week is 40 <laughs> bucks a month. That, that pays the rent. Uh, so I went to, I said bye-bye to Clarence. And I went to Clarksburg. And, uh, uh, and I was there about three months. And I get a phone call. He said, er, there's some guy on the phone from... Parkersburg. So I pick up the phone. He said, hello. He said, this is Clarence. I said, oh, yeah, how you doing? He said, look, he said, uh, I'm not going to beat around the bush. How would you like to come back? <laughs> I said, well, and I'm, my mind is running, you know, maybe he's going to offer me another $10 <laughs> a week. I said, well, I, I certainly would have to consider it. I said, how much? He said, uh, how much? He said, well, the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I said, the same thing. I said, well, why, why would I come back? I'm not going to come back for the same thing. And he said, you ungrateful bastard. <laughs> and he, he slammed down the phone. Because <laughs> he had given me my big break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, pre, you know, I worked, in, I worked for stations in, in Waterloo, Iowa. I worked for a tiny station near near Portland, Oregon. The station when I when I took the job, never looked at it. They said it's Portland and three of the investors are Frank Sinatra, Danny Thomas, and Danny Kay. And I said, Oh, it must be a great station. <laughs> so I said, 
you know, I'll, I'm on my way. <laughs> so I went out there. I find out the station is not in uh, Portland. It was in Milwaukee, Oregon, which is about 20 miles north of Portland. <laughs> and it's in, the station was about the size of our kitchen. <laughs> uh, and and the, the manager, owner manager's wife was also the business manager. Red lights started flashing right away. <laughs> this is not going to be good. <laughs> and uh, it was a terrible station. And about three, I was there about three months, and the program director at the station said, Irv, the ratings are awful here. He <laughs> said, I've got some great ideas. He says, I've written a letter to Les. Les was the manager. He said, I've written him a letter and uh, with some suggestions about how I think we can improve the situation here. And I read the letter, and it was a very reasonable, and it had some very good suggestions. And he said, would you sign it? He said, the morning guy signed it. So I said, sure. So I signed it, and uh, uh, the program director had signed it, and uh, the morning man signed it. And uh, uh, the program director brought it in to the owner general manager we were all fired the next day <laughs> we're all, all three of us were, were cashiered uh, the next day and ironically it was the day before Thanksgiving oh, so boy. that was that, that nice. was nice, that was nice. <laughs> yeah. and I came, I came home and I told Elaine I'd been fired Elaine is my wife and uh, she said you know I was just absolutely distraught here we are 3,000 miles away from Kith and Kin in Rochester, New York, which is my hometown. And she said, yeah, it'll be fine. You know, you'll find something else. And subsequently, uh, I did. There's more with Irv, Rick, and Tom, giants of Buffalo television, right after this. Welcome back to the giants of Buffalo television. When, when you first went on in front of a TV camera, did you feel like you had to be like the, those other guys, stiff and formal? I did, yeah, I did. And it just didn't work because it wasn't me. I had just come across the alley from rock and roll radio. And uh, I was one of America's first rock and roll <laughs> radio, radio, well, radio <laughs> newsmen. Yeah. Uh, where you could say things like pistol packing punks <laughs> and buffalo blaze busters and smoke and eaters pulse and call prostitution. Pulse, pulse beat news, right? Pulse, pulse beat news. <laughs> right. KB Pulse beat news. We called, we didn't call women prostitutes. We called them people who received coins for loins. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that awful? Well, yeah. You know, you can probably tweet that now and somebody might recall that. But Tom, I was going to say, you started in radio as well. Right. And you're from Western New York. And Rick started in radio and, and in acting from Western New York. And Irv from Rochester. But, uh, you know, Tom, when you came to the station, it wa was it to start as weather or did you start with Commander Tom before the weather or did they uh, come simultaneously? Because you came in 65, I believe. Well, I was hired originally by Red Cook, uh, who was the program director back in those days, as a weatherman. <clears throat> and one of the greatest things that was offered to me was that I wouldn't have to work weekends because at yeah. the other station I was working seven days a week and uh, it was really a trying time. So when Red said, I want you to do the weather at 11 o'clock, Monday through Friday, weekends off, I said, oh, wow, yeah. how fast can I, can, how fast yeah. can I go? Yeah. And um, it was always amusing to me that the chief engineer at that station said to me on the day I left, how can you think about leaving this channel and going to seven at the time Number three in the ratings, or as you say it, number <laughs> as I 10. said, our ratings were worse than the sign off test patterns <laughs> on the other stations. And I'm not exaggerating, yeah. right? Right. We so came out of nowhere, and it took us a long time. So I started with the the what, during all. the weather, and then um, gradually, um, about two months, three months after I was there, four months after I was there, we started, the, the same guy came up to me and said, I want you to be Commander Tom. I said, what? <laughs> I want you to do a kid's show. 
Oh, okay, that sounds exciting, and we'll have Superman on, the old, the old Superman. We'll have two, of, two half hours of that, and we'll throw in cartoons, and we'll see what we can do. And I remember, <laughs> in those days, you got <laughs> talent fee, and I remember the general manager said to me, shortly after it went on the air, Tom, don't count on this extra money as a talent fee, because you never know how long you'll be on. <laughs> well, <laughs> I ran 35 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. You never, it, in those days, you didn't know what the public was going to accept, so I was very lucky. Yeah. We all were. Yes. Wh yeah. Whose idea was it to do weather outside? Well, that happened before I went there. I guess it was a sponsor, a car dealer, that saw somebody in another market do the weather outside mm. and uh, decided that he would want to spon if he sponsored the weather, he was going to have it done outside, and that's how that started. I remember at the other station when I was working, I used to laugh and tee-hee about, oh, that guy's outside doing the weather. And I was inside doing the weather, yeah. and I thought, oh, this is hilarious. Never thought it would be you. And then <laughs> yeah. It's funny how those things happen. You know, uh, in the beginning, sounds like the Bible, in the beginning, <laughs> but in the beginning, uh, Rick and I, we were inside, of course, and we had our own podiums. We stood behind a podium. Rick had a podium here. I had a podium here. Uh -huh. And uh, Rick, one of his sponsors was Ace Flea Dog Collar. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A flea collar for dogs. I mean, <laughs> we were a classy operation. <laughs> and uh, the picture of the dog, it was a drawing actually. Yeah. It was a dog with a six-foot tongue lolling out of the side <laughs> of its jaw, you know? And you were supposed to do a serious yeah. uh, sportscast there. Right. And I remember Rick used to do live commercials in the studio. Yeah. Yep, that's right. You know, uh, I would say we'll be back in a few moments. Someone drove a car into <laughs> yeah, the studio. Right. You would run over there, <laughs> do, do the, the commercial, commercial, then scoot back behind yeah. your podium. Yeah. And... Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I do believe that the weather outside uh, was, was definitely one of the things that set our show, uh, yes. yeah, aside from the other guys uh, in town. And what a perfect city to do the weather outside. If the sun was shining, it was great. We would have little barbecue roasts out there on the patio. Yeah. If the weather was awful, snow blowing your weather board away, the audience sitting in the comfort of they their own homes, it. they loved it. They said to themselves, that poor devil, <laughs> you know? You know, I, I have a, my favorite story about Tom doing the weather outside. <laughs> he, he's doing the weather outside, and all of a sudden he's sort of Moving around like this, oh, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> was a stray dog making love to his left leg. <laughs> 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 I, they never I, took a picture of no, that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then a car with some young punks in it <laughs> yeah. drove by, and they decided to moon <laughs> out yeah. of the window of the car uh, as they drove slowly past <laughs> yeah. uh, Tom's. Tom outside. Yeah. So there were there were some and 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 someone blew off a, a bomb or a, something. A firecracker, yes. a, a rocket or something. A rocket. Yeah. There's something. Enough he's doing scary. saying the weather tomorrow will be boom, <laughs> you know, like that. I remember doing. Irv always had the kicker at the end of the newscast, which was I think one of the highlights of the whole half hour. He always had these funny little stories that he would dig up. Well, this one night I was doing the weather outside and I had to do a live. Wonder Bread commercial, <laughs> and it was snowing and blowing, and you couldn't hardly see me out there, but I went through the commercial holding the loaf of bread, coming back to the studio. You remember what you said? You said, if there's anything funnier than a grown man doing a commercial for bread in a snowstorm, <laughs> I can't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, your, that was your kicker. That was the end. That was oh, the end. that's <laughs> great. I remember that as if you did it yesterday. That is great. <laughs> well, you know, uh, speaking of, you know, my my story at the end of the show, after all the stories of fires and tragedies <laughs> and bank holdups and things like that, you know, I, I thought it was appropriate to do a little, a light story at the end. And I always preface that by finally, I would say finally, and people know something a little different was coming. 
Well, I have been asked over the years, particularly in my senior years, by people, after you pass on to your great reward, <laughs> what, what are they going to put on your headstone? And I said, finally, <laughs> I just, yeah. I think that's so appropriate. <laughs>